I, uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I have a unique ability to retain useless information. Uh, a skill, really. Um, matter of fact, one of the things that uh, I think many of you have heard me tell stories before about going home to Ohio and how my family are, were big Ohio State fans. So one of the traditions that's kind of developed over the years is as we're preparing Thanksgiving meal, a lot of times we will put on an old Ohio State game on the TV. And my brothers and I will sit there as, as we base the turkey every once in a while and, and watch a, a game that took place 10 or 12 or 15 years ago and play by play say what's going to happen prior to what, to, oh, I remember this pass. Or this is an amazing, he's going to make an amazing catch. Or I can't believe that that was a face mask that he called there. Like, what was that ref thinking? You know, we do these sorts of things and we have all this, and my wife and my, my mom and others will walk by and say, how did you, how do you remember that? I don't know. I just do. If my wife texts me at 2 o'clock and says, bring home a gallon of milk, I got nothing by 5. <laughs> but if you need to know about a football game that took place uh, a dozen years ago, like, um, I'm your guy. And, and, and the reality is I can so oftentimes remember things that have very little value in my life and forget things that are utterly important. Today we are wrapping up our series um, entitled The Story of God. Over the last nine months together, we have worked our way through Genesis and Exodus, beginning with creation, seeing once again that, that you and I were designed for relationship, specifically to be in a relationship with our Creator. We saw firsthand the, the devastating effects of, of sin. How this relationship that we were defi- uh, designed for is now broken. We see how the impact um, for Adam and Eve and their relationship with Yahweh, and we've experienced how that's continued on throughout the years. And despite sort of all these failed attempts to regain that which was lost, God then decides that He will move to us. He will pursue humanity. So He sets apart this man named Abram. And He establishes a covenant with him whereby He says He will bless all the families of the earth. Through Abraham and ultimately then His extended family, God will advance this covenant promise. He would establish his people, Israel. Jacob and, and, all, and his son Joseph ultimately lead this family to Egypt. Generations later, the people of Israel become an enslaved and an oppressed people. But even in the midst of their oppression, God protects and advances his covenant promise. He ultimately will redeem the people of Israel out of their slavery, and he uses Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. Israel, in the book of Exodus, has made it now to the wilderness. They have left Egypt. They've experienced the presence of God in the tabernacle. They've experienced the provision of God in manna. And yet they've not yet arrived to the promised land that God has set in front of them. So they wait. Because of their lack of faith, because of disobedience, they will wait in the wilderness until an entire generation dies off. They continue to wait for 40 years. Today, as we conclude this series, we are going to look at a passage in the book of Deuteronomy, when the waiting is now almost over. And Moses is going to prepare the people to enter into this promised land that God has set in front of them. The book of Deuteronomy, by the way, is a book of preparation. It it records Moses sort of series of sermons that he delivers to the people of Israel as he prepares them for what's next. 
As such, Deuteronomy is an extremely practical book. Moses is seeking to instruct the people of Israel on how they are to live, given everything that they have seen God do. The people of Israel, in the course of their history, have experienced in in dramatic and really powerful ways God's redemption. They they have seen with their own eyes His salvation and and grace. As we talked about, they've, they've lived in His provision and amongst His presence more than anyone else on earth. And so Moses is asking the question, in light of all of this, How then should we live? Which, by the way, also makes Deuteronomy an extremely practical book for us as the church. Because it's asking very relevant questions to a group of people who've experienced very similar things. You and I, as as the body of Christ, who've experienced His grace, who've seen His salvation, who understand His redemption, what Moses is saying to the people of Israel as he prepared to enter into the promised land offers a lot of application for us. So Moses now, as he's beginning to prepare the people, as he wants to instruct Israel on what's next, begins to show them the power of remembering. The power of remembering. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to spend most of our time this morning working our way through this chapter, beginning in verse 1. It says, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, or your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart, as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. There's a, there's a number of ways that we could approach and think about Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, and there's a lot of applications that we, can withdraw, that we could take out of this. But for our purposes here today, I really want to look at two perspectives that I believe Moses is, is framing up for the people of Israel with this specific instruction to remember. And the first is he wants them to consider this perspective of of looking back. A look back. You'll see again in verse 2 that he begins this instructions and says, you shall remember. As a culture, we, we set up certain times in our life in order to remember. Last weekend, we we celebrated Memorial Day. As a culture, we've understood that it is going to be essential going forward that we remember that people paid the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that you and I experience. So we designate a time, we set it aside, and it's, it's important for us to remember this. We have things like graduation parties, which are a celebration of an accomplishment. But if you go, if you've been to any of the graduation parties this spring, You always see the table laid out with all the little pictures from the time they were in kindergarten and they're missing teeth and their bangs are crooked and all, you know, they're disheveled. And over the years, you've seen them grow. We're remembering the story of this person in their life. We celebrate that. We have things like birthdays and anniversaries. Don't don't forget the anniversaries. Those are big ones. We, We create times to Remember the significant moments of our life. I just saw a few wives elbow their husbands in that last. Moses is now approaching the end of his life. And he's preparing Israel for what is in front of them. And as they, as they exit this season of waiting and they look forward to the promised land, Moses says, you, you need to remember. Remember. 
It's interesting here that Moses, what he's going to call them to remember specifically is, is really the last 40 years that they've spent in the wilderness. He doesn't so much draw on their ancient history and, and Abraham and all that. He says, let's, let's remember what we've experienced over the course of the last 40 years in the wilderness. That word wilderness translates, it's uninhabitable land. So Moses is saying, don't, don't forget the season that you've been in where you were entirely dependent upon God where you had nothing that you could do. The land offered you nothing. Don't forget what you learned there, what you saw. I think Moses points out specifically a couple things that, that he wants them to recall in these last 40 years. I think this perhaps sounds a bit obvious, but the first thing that he wants to draw out for them, and this is essential, is, is he says, you need to make sure that you remember who God is. Remember who God is. At the center of this call to remember is, is, the, is the understanding of, of who God is and what he's done. This entire series that we've been in over the last nine months has been entitled The Story of God. And all along the way we've said this is the story of God because he is the central character. Moses is, is making a similar point here. As the people of Israel, as they're preparing for the promised land, stop and remind yourself who God is. Remind yourself what you discovered about him in the desert. He's going to draw out a few sort of specific elements of this. In verse 2, when he says, you shall remember, he says, the whole way the Lord God has led you. Israel has spent the last 40 years in the wilderness wandering. But Moses is making an absolutely essential point. He's saying your wandering has not been aimless wandering. It has been purposeful wandering. God was leading you even in the wandering over the last 40 years were brought about as a result of disobedience and, and lack of faith. But even in the midst of that, the people of God are experiencing God's guidance as he takes them through this season of waiting. From the point in time that the, the people of Israel are leaving Egypt to this very moment here where they stand at, at the edge of a whole new life, there's been multiple, multiple times when they have doubted that guidance, when they've questioned his care or his purpose. And so now Moses, with the benefit of hindsight, he's calling them to look back and to see the journey as a whole, and he says, look Look where God has brought you. I think there's wisdom for us here. So you think about our own lives, our own relationships. I will say that in seasons of difficulty and seasons where I am at my most desperate time, I will oftentimes look around me and, and mistakenly think that, that God has left me there to manage that on my own. That for whatever reason, He, he has abandoned me in that place. Somehow my circumstances prevent me from seeing his activity, and it's oftentimes not till I'm much, much, much further down the road that I look back at that season and I see all the long that he was with me and he was guiding me and he was taking me somewhere. Moses says, look and see that the Lord your God has guided you, even in your wandering. In verse 3, he talks about the provision of, of manna. Moses calls the people of God to remember that it is God who has provided for them, and he's done so, it says in the text, by the power of his word. Therefore, Israel, it is God's word that gives life. It is God himself who has made a way for you in a land that has offered you nothing. Verse 4 has that that somewhat sort of obscure statement where it says your, your clothing did not wear out on you and your, your foot did not swell. Again, here Moses is pointing out that this provider God, this guiding God is the sustaining God. That the natural consequences that you would expect of life in the wilderness, that, that you didn't experience things under God's watchful care. All of this, all of this and more, Moses is saying, is intended to remind you who God is. 
It's tended to remind you that the very God who has, has made the covenant with the people of Israel is also the same God who is faithful to keep it. This is, by the way, important for us to understand. This is one of the fundamental roles for you and I as the church. Meaning corporately, collectively, but also relationally between us. That we're, we're to remind each other who God is. We're supposed to speak that truth to each other. And I'll tell you, there's going to be a time in my life when I need you to remind me of that. That maybe I'm doubting, is, is God really good? Please be the ones who speak that to me. And, and I hope and I pray that there'll be opportunities when I can be the one to speak that to you. We need to remind each other of that truth and that reality. Because we can have a tendency to start adopting a lesser or a, a skewed understanding of God and we need to speak these things to each other. But Moses here is going to make a second point as he's calling them to look back. He also wants them to remember who they are. Remember who you are, who we are. There's this really stark contrast that's inherent here in the text. On the one hand, as we've seen, we've got the guidance and the provision and the sustainment of God. On the other hand, we have this people who need to be humbled, tested, and disciplined. Moses wants them to hold on to, to remember to what God has revealed to them about themselves. This, this time in the wilderness has been a season of refinement. Uh, it has exposed pride and it's confronted sin. It, it brought them to a place where self-reliance was not an option. It humbled them. And Moses says, you need to remember this. Who you were before God led you in to the wilderness. What you learned about yourself. The philosopher and poet George Santayana for, uh, famously said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Moses is making a very similar point here to Israel. Now that you're leaving the wilderness, now that you're heading to what's next, don't forget what you experienced here, what you learned about who he is and about who you are. You are a people that have seen the salvation and grace of our God. You've experienced in, in the wilderness. Moses says to the people of Israel, your life should be different. Your life, because of what you've experienced, should be different. In verse 6, it says, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His way and by fearing Him. People of Israel, church, Remember who he is. Remember who we are and our need for him. As they approach this new season of life, if you turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, let's pick it up in verse 7. Moses is going to describe what's in front of them now. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he gives you. So Moses here paints this very stark, different contrast. The life that they've been living and this which they're heading, there's this massive transition in front of the people of Israel. And so as he's building these perspectives, he says, begin by looking back, but now that you have looked back and you've remembered who God is and who you are, he says, now look forward. Let's look forward. He paints this drastically different picture for the people of Israel. The differences between life and the wilderness, which have been defined by scarcity and difficulty and utter dependence. And now he's painting this picture of the good land where there is abundance. 
ease and, and comfort. These are, these are completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And Moses says, before you enter this land, before everything changes, you must remember. It's interesting how massive shifts in our life can cause us to forget the lessons we learned in the past. I've seen studies done where people who have won the lottery or people who have received some sort of windfall of cash, within five years of receiving that, over 70% of those people are broke. Where somehow that, that this life that they live, where they're paycheck to paycheck and they're getting by, and all of a sudden there's this massive amount of of surplus and all the things that they knew and did regularly and the ways that they survived prior to that moment are completely forgotten. So much so that five years later, after receiving a sum of money that should provide for them for life, and it's all gone. We have a way of, of doing this. We have a way of, of allowing that the life of, of plenty allows us to forget the life where, where we were utterly dependent. So Moses continues now in verse 11. He says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and the thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he may humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Moses now provides a pretty stark warning. And his instructions here are sort of twofold, as we've talked about he begins by saying to the people of Israel, I want you to remember. I want you to think back to what you learned about who God is and who you are. But then taking that, he says, be careful lest you forget. The command to remember is the command to look back. The command not to forget, don't forget, is the command to keep remembering. He's saying you're going to need to come back to this. Because if you don't, the lessons that you learned in the wilderness will be forgotten in the land of plenty. Moses is giving the people a warning, and there's a trajectory here in this text. He says, remember who God is. Remember that he's the one that provided for you, that sustained you. And he says, be careful not to forget. Because if you forget, you will be prone to idolatry and pride. And idolatry and pride will ultimately lead to disobedience, and disobedience leads to destruction. Moses is saying, if you forget God, if you start to believe that all of this is the result of your own effort, of your power and might, he says, then you, Israel, are in a very dangerous place. He concludes this way. Verse 18 to the end of the chapter. He says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of of the Lord your God. King David says it this way in the Psalms. Chapter 16, verse 4, he said, The sorrows of those who run after other gods shall multiply. And this is ultimately Moses' point. He says, don't substitute other gods, these small g gods, for the real thing. Because these gods don't love you. 
because this isn't, these aren't the gods that have provided for you, although we commonly believe, we mistake that they do. These small g gods aren't the God who has guided you. They aren't the God who has sustained you, and they certainly are not the God that can save you. Moses says, be careful lest you forget. It's been said before, we forget what we do not take time to remember. Moses is teaching the people here the power of remembering. In the Gospel of Luke, as Jesus is celebrating Passover with his disciples, for the last time he takes bread and breaks it and he says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus has provided us with a way to remember. He knew that we would need to be reminded that the covenant maker, our God, who has provided a way for salvation is the covenant keeper. And it led him all the way to the cross. Jesus told us to remember because he knew that we would need the reality of our past, what he has done for us, to inform the reality of our future. As I close us this morning, I simply want to allow a few moments of guided remembrance. I I want you to think about specific times that you have seen God, that you have met him in personal ways. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I just want you to silently consider these moments in your life. Do you remember a time when God's presence, his activity in your life was so obvious that you could not deny it or dismiss it? Think for a moment. Do you remember a time when God's provision for you was so personal and specific? Reminded that He knows you personally, individually. He loves you enough to meet that need. Can you think of that time? Can you remember a time when God has proven Himself faithful? beyond measure. According to Moses, brothers and sisters, we need to remember. Just, just before this service, I was having a conversation with a friend. We are sharing a story of God's incredible faithfulness in their life. And I, I just said, get something to put in your home, that every time you look at it, every time you see it, it will remind you of this moment because because if, if Moses has taught us anything, we will need to remember. Would you pray with me? Father, we we recognize that that your goodness, your provision, your sustainment in our lives is is without question. And even in the moments when it seems far from me and I don't understand it or I can't see it, Lord, I know these things are true of you. So Lord, I pray that you would forgive my forgetfulness. That you would remind me once again of who you are. That as I understand my need for you, that I would run back to the one true God, the covenant maker, who not only makes the promise, but keeps it. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we have one more thing to remember. Next week, we start at 10 o'clock. If you come at 8.30, you will be by yourself.
If you'd stand with me, please, for the benediction. Leave now, remembering that we have been bought with a price, remembering that we belong to Jesus in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who was given at Pentecost. Amen. Of the benevolent offering, something we do each, each month during communion. If you were prepared for that, we would love for your gifts as well.